Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and we're going to do something a little bit different. We've not done a mod review in a while, but a rather large mod has just recently dropped on the workshop which adds in 16 playable legendary lords and factions into the Immortal Empires Expanded mod. Yes, yeah, so you'll need the large version of the Immortal Empires, but I feel like this is a really cool mod because it fleshes out the world a little bit and it hits a variety of different cultures. But yeah, we're going to go into all the different factions, the first one being Arbol the Undefeated. This is a corn character from way back in the day. This character also rides atop of a Flesh Hound of corn, which is a nice little throwback to an old metal miniature that he had. But yeah, faction effects, destroyer of corn. Victories provide momentum and subsequent boons. Corn's Curse. When defeated, Corn's punishment will be unrelenting. Hero capacity plus two for cultists. Attribute. Devastating flanker for hounds of corn units, all armies, which is pretty damn tasty. And finally, for the Lord effects, we've got Destroy of Corn, Corn's Curse, and melee attack plus ten for all units in the army. You're obviously going to be focusing on a lot of melee stuff, surprise, surprise, because you're playing as a corn monogod faction. So your star position is in the southern tip of Ind, meaning that you've got a bunch of different factions to fight. Immortal Empires Expanded obviously does open up these regions, which makes it pretty cool for you. And yeah, you start off with the mount, which is amazing. It, it, again, it makes me remember this really old miniature that I really should repaint at some point, because yeah, 12-year-old Nathan did not have a lot of talent painting, didn't finish paints, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Naturally, this character also is very heavily focused on melee combat, surprise, surprise, and you're going to be able to boost up pretty much a lot of your beasties, making your uh, bloodletters and exalted bloodletters have perfect vigor too, which is absolutely amazing. All in all, this one is a very powerful fighter. He's not going to hit as hard as, say, for example, Scarbrand, when Scarbrand's really good at taking out, you know, big swaths of enemies, but he's very good at singular combat, he's very good at taking out characters, and uh, yeah, he's durable too, which is important. Now, he does have a unique mechanic for this faction, and it's essentially just get into combat, win loads of uh, battles, and you'll be able to get more and more bonuses, and when you get to the end, you'll also be able to replenish your movement. You might remember this from Torox, the Brass Bull, or if you've been playing uh, Free Kingdoms a lot, which, for example, I have lately, which is really weird. Um, <laughs> it's very similar to that of, well, it's identical to that of Lu Bu. So yeah, you're going to be able to get a lot more from this. You're going to be a lot more mobile. Keep in mind that if you do lose or retreat or anything, you will actually take some negatives too. So it's very important to not only pick your fights, but make sure that you're going to go in to win. Which, I mean, your corn, it doesn't really take that much. You've got a bunch of pretty strong troops. Next, we're going to the Dwarfs with Burlock Daminson. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of characters. One thing that I really love seeing is this old school way of having like, the banners on the back. This is a uh, very old hammer. <laughs> it's very nice. So let's jump in with the faction Lord Effects. Pioneers has access to various legendary adventurers through the Forge mechanic. Hero recruit rank plus 3 for Master Engineers. Construction time minus 25% for all engineering chain buildings faction wide. Range plus 10% for all armies. And for the Lord Effects, explosive missile damage plus 20% for artillery units. And hero capacity plus 2 for Master Engineers. This is for those people who like playing range heavy dwarf armies. You'll also be starting off in the northern tip of Ind. There's a lot of legendary characters through this mod added into Int, Koresh, and the Eastern Steps, obviously just to flesh out the world a little bit more. It's a pretty good start position, I've been playing with this campaign myself. Obviously it doesn't fix all the issues that the Dwarfs have vanilla-wise and, you know, lack of troops and so on, but if you add this in with some unit mods and so on, you should be golden. But yeah, let's continue. Obviously we got to look towards the... Um, unique skill line where you can reduce the cost once again by 25% for all engineering buildings, uh, also increase, well, reduce the reload time reduction for all your artillery, so you're going to be firing a lot faster, increase the speed towards your army, uh, even get a bit more campaign movement range, which does help when you're an end and obviously pushing into cafe later. You've also got free items which are pretty strong. This character is pretty good, honestly, I must say. With dwarfs, I've always loved the dwarfs. Uh, we have to obviously keep in mind that the biggest issue for the dwarfs is, you know, free reworks and still not in the best place. But mechanically, they're in an okay area. It's just the army needs a little bit of a boost. But yeah, so you can get access to a bunch of unique items and also unique characters. I won't bring these guys in. You guys can find them as you progress. And this is all done through the forge mechanics, so it's just adding into something that you already have. 
The items themselves can be fairly powerful. The most important thing is you'll need to start conquering. And from uh, what I remember, you'll have to go to places like Nippon, the Lost Isles, Crash, and so on. Uh, again, use the stuff that you're going to be doing anyway, right? You're going to be exploring these areas as you naturally start expanding your empire. Now we're going into a very unique one. This is Alphonse Donmans. And yep. Your eyes aren't deceiving you. It's a Snesh character mixed up with Bretonia. This means that you're going to have a little bit of fun, you're going to be able to experiment a little bit, and have a completely unique playthrough. With the faction effects and lord effects, we have the following. Wine-producing buildings provide unique global bonuses. They do not have access to the chapel building, but instead has access to Snesh sorcerers, pleasurable acts, and replenishment via captives. Hero capacity plus two for Chaos Sorcerers of Sinesh, Speed plus 15% for all armies. And for the Lord Effects, Devotees plus 10 per turn. Ability Heartbreaker and Melee Attack plus 10. Already it's going to be quite unique, especially with the very, very fast horses. And once again, you are in the territories of Ind. See, a bunch of characters being added here actually makes the world feel a little bit more alive. It also kind of slows down, if you've played with Immortal Empires Expanded, the really radically weird expansion that uh, Nakai tends to do. So it does actually help a little bit. <laughs> in terms of unique skill line, you've got quite a few different augments coming in. Uh, you're going to be able to boost up your Sinesh characters quite a bit with extra melee defense and... Yeah, you're going to be able to make your um, peasants kind of frenzy, which is kind of funny. Uh, all in all, this is going to be a more aggressive faction. If you want to play as Evil Bretonia, which I know a lot of people want to do, uh, yeah, you've got this character. It's definitely going to add in a, a little bit of a different playstyle. Uh, I know actually back in the day when you could do with the weird ally list and so on. People used to do that in the tabletop. But uh, being able to play with that in Total War is a bit weird. You've got access to some uh, Marauders also, some Chaos Warriors. You get access to a few of the foot troops. So you can mix and match foot troops with Bretonian Chargers uh, for something pretty terrifying, in all honesty. You can make it pretty tasty. And then you add that in with the baseline Sinesh mechanics, like for example, you've got the Devotees, which then allows you to use the Dictats, which will give you rapid growth and allow you to build up very quickly. Yeah, if you know what you're doing and you don't get destroyed by the Cornate faction right below you or the Dwarfs near you, and well, there's a lot of things that are going to want to kill you straight off the bat, yeah, you'll be golden. All right, we're going on to the Dark Elves now with Durafe Hellbane. The faction effects are as follows. Lord Recruit rank plus three. Black Ark Corsairs, handbows, use repeater crossbows instead, which is uh, pretty tasty. Uh, sea Lane's journey duration minus one turn faction wide. And the ability focus shot for all Black Ark characters. For the Lord effects, uh, you have as follows. Mal attack plus eight for Black Ark Corsair units in Lord's army and immune to high seas, reef and storm attrition. Pretty good, because uh, you're going to be moving around a lot, especially as a Dark Elf. And there's a lot of oceans for you to kind of take over. Especially with now everything being opened up a little bit more, as you're going to be playing with, uh, you know, Nippon in the area, the Lost Isles, the High Seas can cause a lot of problems. But naturally, that's just subjective for who you are and what you play. But in terms of your start position, you're going to be... Again, in Ind, don't worry, there's a few in Koresh too, and other locations. But in the very top part there, so you're right at the ocean, you're going to be dealing with uh, pretty much an Ogre Legendary Lord that we'll talk about a bit later. You've also got Kugaf in the area. Uh, your immediate threats are likely that, and, uh, well, our good buddy Helmengorst. But, yeah, don't, you shouldn't have to be worried about Helmengorst. Now what makes this character very unique is he himself is a Black Orc, meaning that he's a pseudo horde. I'm a big fan of this, it's something that I really want for Lokia Felhart in vanilla, because it just makes a lot of sense. But yeah, you're going to be able to move around, you're going to be able to recruit. You've got access to a uh, unique building though, which is going to make your Black Orc Corsairs a little bit better, get more captives, more movement range. Overall, it's, it's just pretty good. And yeah, in terms of unique skill line, it's focusing on quite a few things. The big thing is the first skill that you get increases growth for all your Black Orcs faction-wide, which is 
insane if you're one of those people like me, if you play a lot of Dark Elves with a decent amount of Black Arcs, you're going to be able to increase your speed. This character is fairly killy. Um, obviously, keep in mind that he is range also, so he is a proper hybrid. Again, if you like Black Arc Corsairs, this is likely the character for you. Okay, so we're going to be jumping back to Chaos. There's a lot of Chaos characters. Uh, but this guy is a big hype because this is Engra Deathsword, a very important character way back in the day during the whole uh, Great War Against Chaos, which this is a character we're likely going to see in Warhammer the Old World um, because, yeah, I mean, he is the lieutenant of Asavar Kool. But, yeah, let's talk about the faction effects. Everchosen's Headmaster, gifting conquered settlements to Archeon, provides shared bonuses with the Warhost of the Apocalypse. Loyalist starts with an unbreakable pact with the Warhost of Apocalypse. So yeah, you can't fight Archeon, you're kind of subservient to him. It's one of those factions if you're going to be playing a co-op. This might be the one for you. Melee attack plus 8 for melee infantry units in all armies, plus 1% weapon strength for each currently vassaled faction for own forces and the Warhost of the Apocalypse. Again, for Lord's Army, uh, Lord Effects, we got Death Sword's Fury, and weapon strength plus 15% when fighting against Kislev for all units in your army. Pretty tasty, right? The character's going to start in Warhammer Korea, so you're a bit far from Archeon, but you're still going to get the benefits. Getting to him isn't going to really take that long, especially as a Chaos Warrior faction where you're just going to be smashing your way through it, and pretty much all the Northern Chaos Wastes is easy terrain for you. But you don't really want to go for him, you'll want to expand, go down south into Warhammer Korea, and then launch an invasion of Cafe, whilst also simultaneously taking over the Eastern Steps. His unique skill line focuses very, very heavily on combat, so... Yeah, you're pretty much in a good place. You're also going to be able to get a lot more souls, which souls are a key resource, not only because you're a warrior as a chaos faction, but also because you're going to be using them very heavily as Engra to get some benefits from Archeon to Archeon to you. Recruiting Marauders uh, with all armies are also going to get better. So yeah, you're going to be in a pretty good spot as the faster you get them recruited, obviously the faster you're going to be able to boost them up into a uh, god-devoted warrior. So souls you'll naturally get as you start getting into battles and so on, and yeah, you're going to be able to get some pretty good bonuses all around for not only yourself, but Archeon, meaning that Archeon's going to get a lot stronger just off the top there. You'll get some bonuses like, for example, leadership plus 10 and melee attack plus 5 for all armies. Uh, hit points plus 10% for all characters, melee defense plus 5 for all armies, and ward save plus 10% for all armies. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a natural gain. Again, if you're going to do a co-op with someone playing as Archeon, you'll both get all the benefits. If not, you can just play it as Engra, and yeah, you can still have a lot of fun without dealing with an Archeon. But yeah, if you want to roleplay, definitely a roleplay campaign. Okay, taking a break from Chaos a little bit, we've got an Ogre character over here, very different. So, faction effects. Master mercenary contractors may spawn after successful battles in enemy territories. Recruitment cost minus 20% for man-eater units. Unit mass plus 5% for all armies. Melee attack plus 10 for all man-eater units in all armies. And for your Lord effects, neutral troops entering your region will be forced to pay a toll for your local region. So, yeah, you'll be able to get a little bit of money if you can make sure that you can expand in a way that you've got people just moving through those areas. And finally, enemy leadership minus seven, enemy armies in local province. All in all, pretty good stuff. Uh, this is a very interesting design. Obviously, you've got the Empire Pantaloons over there, which is a nice little throwback to the old um, Manita, well, one of them. And yeah, when you start, you'll be in Ind once again. Surprise, surprise. So I had to double check there. But yeah, you'll be moving into Grand Cafe without uh, really taking too long. So you do have a friend there with Zhao Ming. Obviously, down in the south, you've got some uh, factions that you're already at war with. You're going to be at war with some others. There's always that issue with Herman Gorst, but you've got a bit of a mountain wall protecting you, so I wouldn't really be too worried. Now, I'll be honest with you, I couldn't get the contractors to spawn. I know it works, it's just bad RNG. But, uh, yeah, that happens. But in terms of mount option, you actually get a Rhinox mount, which is nice. The character increases unit mass for your army. There's some pretty fun, unique skills there, just to make your troops a bit stronger, a lot cheaper too, which is really tasty, especially in this area where you're going to be fighting around in multiple locations. All in all, very interesting for an ogre faction. I haven't played much with him, but that's mostly because... Well, I'm just not going to lie, I don't like the ogres on how they play. It's, um... 
It's just one of these factions which I just can't get into. Alright, going for something very different now, going into the Tomb Kings, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name, but let's jump into the faction effects. All generic lords have access to the empowered Pactoth, the God of the Sky and Justice skill, unit capacity plus 4 for Carrion. You can earn additional rewards by reconquering an Amenenhetem's uh, Great Realm. This is later down the line. It's not something that you're going to be dealing with at the beginning of your campaign. Uh, melee defense plus six for lords and embedded heroes for all armies. And for lord effects, we've got Petra's Intimate uh, Judgment. Speed plus 20% for carrying units and lords army. And speed plus 20%, so it's generally just quite fast to move around. I mean, the bird head kind of helps, right? So this character is starting fairly far off in Nippon, which is pretty cool as the start position. It gives you something very varied because all the Tomb Kings are... Either very close, well, three of them, and then you've got um, Katep, who is um, existing. <laughs> I know some people like Katep, it's just it's not me. It's not for me. But, yeah, overall, it's nice to have a different uh, <laughs> start position. Obviously, this character does have unique skill lines. The first one being really good at rank 11. You get plus 15% research uh, speed, which, again absolutely amazing everything else is pretty good bonuses too it's the main thing there because you know research is so important you can get campaign movement range back after winning a battle uh, reduce enemy leadership i am a big fan i'm honestly a big fan of how everything is looking for this character i haven't played tomb kings in oh god a fair while actually so it might be a character that i'll play again you've obviously got some unique items too it's nice that this mod is increasing in terms of rarity because there's factions for everyone there's a little bit more chaos but then again you know this is the chaos game so it's kind of expected but yeah and in regards to reconquering the old realm it's in essentially what is the Southern Realm. So obviously Matorka, Rifrafa, Tobaro, all that type of stuff. It's going to be a while for you to be able to get that. You will get some bonuses. Uh, it's all about taking those locations. So what you can do is after you've taken Nippon, send a force down there. I don't know how you guys use this mod. If for me, I've been planning, like I've been playing on building tall and going to different locations, having different invasions going out. I feel like it's very doable when you've got much more of an open area. And if you're in an isolated country like Nippon, then it's going to be easier for you to move around. Back onto Chaos, specifically Norska, there's actually a, I think about three of them. But yeah, we got Surfer Lenk here. He's a big boy, as you can see. Dude is thick with two Cs. But yeah, faction effects. Monster pens capture a variety of hideous beasts and send them into battle. Unmatched horror, Lenk will directly face monsters hidden within the Arcanum. This is obviously to do with monster hunts. Uh, recruitment rank plus three for Marauder Hunters with Javelins. Ability Kurgan bred for Marauder Horsemen units in all armies. Speed plus 10% for all armies. And when we go into the Lord effects, we got Armor Piercing Missile Damage plus 25% for Marauder Hunters, Javelins, and Lord's Army. And Range plus 10% for Lord's Army. So you're going to have a bit of a range army for uh, this faction, which is fairly decent in all honesty. I mean, still not the best thing, because, like, you know, Norse can range, but still. You can do a fair amount of damage with them, and keep in mind that, obviously, the one thing that their range does very well is being able to harass from a distance, so having a bit of extra range and also more armor-piercing missile damage is going to be very good when you start dealing with the Chaos Warrior armies around the area if you start fighting them. And where you start is actually quite a cool place. So this is the Eastern Steps. Um, it's a pretty cool area. Mostly because it gives you a little bit of breathing room before you start dealing with Cafe. I mean, you can ignore Cafe all you want if the uh, proper eastern portion of the eastern steps. There are teleporters to take you to where Valkyr is and so on, but that completely depends on to your own playstyle. So in regards to the unique skill line, yeah, I mean, it's going to focus on missile strength. This is a hybrid character, by the way, so you'll be getting a little bit of shots over there. You can get him mounted on a Marauder Chariot too, which is pretty damn tasty. Uh, extra money from uh, raiding and so on. And yes, I know the mammoths there, but like the chariots faster. Uh, extra hit points, unit mass. It depends, obviously. If you want to go full Kurgan, you're going to want as many horsemen as possible. And then obviously bring in the chariots. Uh, if you can get a good unit mod too, just to flesh the faction out a little bit. Because it's going to kind of be needed. Um, we really need some proper Kurgan units at some point, if anyone from CA is listening. And obviously you've got Monster Hunt, so just like Rakath, you just get into fights and naturally you'll start picking them up and being able to use these units for other things. Yeah, sounds good. 
honestly, it's a pretty good system and allows you to have a lot of fast moving beasties. All right, we got a wood elf here. This is Saolan. So yeah, let's look at the faction effects. Embrace the cold receives bonuses for entering regions with a frozen climate and magical forests. Casualty replenishment plus 10% for all armies. Weapon strength plus 10% for eternal guard and dryad units for all armies. And for lord effects, you have upkeep minus 25% for all elf units. Ability frozen fury and ability uh, Attil with uh, rangers for wood elf missile units and lord's army. Uh, it's annoying how the elves have very very strange names <laughs> but you'll be starting off in the lost isles of caliph which means that you're going to be able to be in a pretty safe location mostly because you're nobody's going to come down there well yeah the ai does come down there but you'll be able to expand pick up those locations and then start teleporting around because obviously that's what a wood elf campaign does you'll still be doing the usual wood elf stuff but um it's actually quite interesting to know how popular the wood elves are in general so yeah i mean it's kind of cool at the end of the day uh it depends if you like wood elves or not i've not played this character much keep in mind this mod only came out like two days ago uh but yeah i mean very fast he gets a forest dragon mount uh able to do quite a decent amount of damage he is essentially a pretty good hybrid like better range than anything else and that again focuses on your specific playstyle more than anything else uh, the faction is still very, very cool. I think for me, it's more the case of I'm not too keen on the Wood Elves. Like, they had a really good rework, don't get me wrong, so I'm not criticizing Creative Assembly there. It's just I've never really been into the Wood Elves in general, uh, like, even on the tabletop, even though they were one of the most powerful armies in 8th edition. Like, holy crap. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just never been a faction that's resonated with me. So, kind of happens here too. You still get offices and stuff, by the way, which you get some pretty good spells, uh, you get some pretty good effects overall. If you're a Wood Elf fan, here's another reason to play them. All right, I didn't totally forget one character and then have to go back to record stuff. <laughs> this is Orgot's Demon Spew. So we got a into the end time situation here. So faction effects. Aspiring Gardener, Orgot seeks the Rot Father's favor by cleansing the unfaithful from his gardens. Allegiance points gain plus 25% for alliances and vassalage with Nurgle. Nurgle corruption in adjacent provinces plus 2 for all provinces. Recruit rank plus 2 for pox riders, all armies. And uh, when we go to the Lord effects, we've got diplomatic relations plus 25 with Norska, which is pretty good. And ability, Orgot's riders for pox riders, Lord's army. And your campaign starts off in the Far Eastern Steppe, so if you like corner starts, which I know some people do, I, for example, like a corner campaign, um, yeah, this one works out quite well. You've also got the teleporter there, which will take you to Valkyr, uh, a very cool, interesting system there. Um, yeah, it's still Nurgle, so this depends if you really like the faction or not, because Nurgle itself is inherently a little bit flawed, but overall, I think the faction is pretty fun. This is a character that I quite like too, because, I mean, you know, it's a pretty interesting one, and it's always nice to have a different outlook on Nurgle rather than Kugath, who is stuck in <laughs> just a place that just doesn't fit for him. But yeah, other than that, the character is focusing on uh, basically making himself a little bit stronger. You get extra hit points, uh, extra physical resistance and melee attack for Lord's army, uh, more experience gain for their units to uh, reduced recruitment cost for your mod and demon units. Like, yeah, this, this dude can make your army very, very strong. This is for his specific army. Uh, he's not mounted, but yeah, you don't need it, I think. Uh, he just really slaps... And I mean really slaps. Going back to Korn, yes, we've got multiple Korn characters. We have Lord Slorif, who has the following faction effects. Ultimate Challenger, hunt down your past fellow knights and sacrifice them to Korn for significant bonuses. Wound recovery time, minus two for all characters, by the way. Armor plus 10 for infantry units and all army. And then for Lord effects, we have Bastions chosen for Bloodletter units. Charge bonus plus 25% for all units in your Lord's army. I mean, it's pretty tasty. Extra armor overall is just going to be pretty strong anyway. And uh, where you start is quite interesting. This is going to be in Koresh. So it's going to allow you a lot of movement, actually. There's a lot of regions around the area for you to expand your influence. You also start off with one complete region and then an island region too. So you're going to have already the ability to kind of build up a fairly decent, well, semi-decent... Um, I can't even say semi-decent. I mean, Korn's economy isn't great. 
it's going to let you build. <laughs> In terms of unique skills, I mean, it's corn, so it's going to focus very heavily on being able to do some damage, giving frenzy to your lord's army, uh, also being able to get uh, just a lot of abilities like hexes and so on, which is quite nice for a corn army. You'll also have the option to get a chaos dragon mount, increased melee defense, extra charge bonuses, because this character is going to be quite good with cavalry stuff, which again, very different for corn. So if you're into that type of stuff, yeah, you're going to be fine. Overall, yeah, pretty good. I mean, it's a corn character. All you have to do is just slam your head into the wall and you win, right? <laughs> but I know a lot of people do like corn characters uh, because, yeah, they do quite a lot of damage. And your unique mechanic is also going to be focusing on kind of like the pieces of eight. So, yeah, you hunt down some um, enemy armies or you take over a location. And from there, you end up getting bonuses like... Uh, physical resistance for all your armies and so on. It's actually pretty tasty. Uh, yeah, you're going to be able to do a lot of damage with this. And they're all around that area too. So it's not going to be go back to the old world. It's all around the areas of, uh, in Koresh, Nippon, and a little bit of the Eastern Steps. So yeah, as you start naturally expanding, yeah, you've pretty much got all the areas there. Going back into Norska, we have Forgar the Blooded One. So, faction effects are as follows. Unbridled ambition finish uh, Forgar's quests and allow him to ascend into demonhood. The Blooded One, uh, Forgar will directly face the monsters hidden within the Arcanum. Again, monster hunts. Uh, upkeep, minus 25% for mammoth units, all armies, which is freaking terrifying. Uh, <laughs> weapon strength plus 10% when fighting against Warriors of Chaos, Demons of Chaos, Chaos Dwarves, and Norska all armies, and finally, Lord Effects campaign movement range plus 20% after winning a battle, and ability for Gar's Pendulum. As you've been able to see, the character starts in the Eastern Steps, right in the border, so you're in the Kurgan territories, and then you can start pushing down after you've taken all the North. Uh, pretty good overall, it's a good start position. Uh, the further up Chaos factions are, the, the better it is for their expansion, to be honest. And in terms of unique skills, we've got the following, obviously, like getting stronger, causing fear, uh, some extra recruit rank for shamans, diplomatic bonuses, uh, more cash from sacking settlements, uh, getting extra armor. Generally, it's kind of well-rounded. I think that's what does the character very well here. Interestingly enough, a lot of buffs to mammoths, but no mammoth mount for him, which kind of makes sense, to be honest. Uh, as he will be ascending to demonhood anyway. Uh, but yeah, you've got a lot of stuff there. You'll be able to summon in a Chaos Spawn with one of your items. You've got four items, one of them being a banner. The banner implementation here is actually really nice. It's been throughout the whole mod. And yeah, you need to do the boons to be able to ascend to demonhood, which is a pretty interesting thing. Uh, you know, it's like control 10 regions, uh, defeat five legendary lords, uh, win 20 battles and I think reach level 30 and then you can ascend to demonhood. That's a pretty interesting thing. It's a nice little throwback if you know, you know. But yeah, overall, I mean, again, very quality stuff from using mechanics that we've already got available, which is cool. So here we've got Turimba. This is a high elf character. We're not going to talk about him too much because he has been available as a mod for a while by his separate form, but now he's also been put into this compilation, which is actually a pretty good thing because that means that you've got um, everything together, you know? Because if a group of modders are making characters, it's nice that they do it as a compilation rather than having, I don't know, 50 million mods uh, <laughs> downloaded. I mean, this is a pretty cool character overall. Uh, as you can see here, no good relations with the Skaven, some pretty good bonuses for your army in terms of movement and so on. The main thing here is that you're going to have access to caravans and uh, you're going to be able to get a lot of cash with this. And I think this is a really cool thing. Obviously, your start position is at the Gates of Caliph. So you've got one of the most strategic areas in terms of Warhammer Fantasy geography, which uh, I know is such a weird uh, conversational point. But, <laughs> I mean, we've had stranger conversations about Warhammer lore on this channel. So, yeah. And uh, <laughs> the character is just pretty good overall. He's a spellcaster. He's going to get stronger as you uh, level him. You're going to be able to get some pretty good bonuses to make him fairly frontline, actually. It's not too bad. Like, he's still... Actually, no, he's not going to be one of the weakest ones, to be honest. I think he's still... He's up there. He's not going to be as strong as Tyrion, for example, who is just absolutely insane. But he can pretty much go on par with a little Master of Hoeth, more or less. 
All right, this one is very, very unique. So this is Valbrand Fireblade, a Norskin faction, but dedicated to corn. So faction effects has access to bloodletting. Slaver may sacrifice slaves to receive powerful boons of corn and chaos. Corn's chosen, Valbrand may directly face the monsters within the Arcanum. My cat is attacking my microphone. I don't know why, but he's just, uh, he doesn't like the microphone. Let's continue. Valbrand's Horde. So, capital tax will be unlocked by raising capitals for corn instead of occupying them. Dedicated to corn, may only devote himself to corn. Has no access to raiding camp stance. Unit mass plus 5% for every concurrent war. This is Lord Effects, by the way. And the ability Valbrand's Eruption. So, what makes this faction so unique is it's a horde. Yeah, we haven't had a horde in... Uh, Good lord, I don't remember how long, actually. But you can only either sack the settlements or raise them in the name of Gorn, which means that you'll get uh, quite a few bonuses. There is one which is not going to work for you because one of them is uh, income from ports. Uh, but you do get the unique... Uh, uh, exalted champion you get some bonuses to doing damage and so on your faction is going to be focusing on just essentially doing some damage moving around again if you want to role play with someone this might be the faction for you you've also got access to chaos gifts so you'll still be able to pick up uh, some pretty cool stuff like some demons or chaos and so on for an oscar faction that's pretty big and you also have access to the um what's it called upgrades so you'll be able to turn your Marauder Spearmen and your basic Marauders into Marauders of Corn and get them all the way up. They can become Chosen, they can become Knights, they can't get Skull Crushers, which it would be a bit of a weakness here, I guess, for uh, the faction, but it very much depends on the player. Overall, I like this. I I've actually played a fair few turns with this, and I've really had a lot of fun. It's definitely different. We haven't had Hordes since Warhammer 2. Because obviously that was the Warriors of Chaos thing. So if you get used to that, you you pretty much... Yeah, it's like kind of riding a bike. You've got some ways to reduce the upkeep for your forces quite heavily. So don't you worry about cash too much. Um, loads of bonuses towards your faction, to be honest. Uh, missile resistance for the character too. Uh, getting slaves generated per turn. So you'll be able to get a lot of bonuses coming in here and there. Uh, seeing as slaves will basically be your souls, in a sense, right? Um... It's unique. It is definitely very, very unique. I wish that Hordes came back, not like for a full faction, before you start screaming at me. I've got to say that very importantly. But like, it would be cool if we had a proper Horde-style vanilla faction at one day, but they have to fix Hordes properly, right? Like, we have semi-Hordes with the uh, Warriors of Chaos, obviously, but I mean like a true-style Horde would be kind of cool. Volric Clawhand is another interesting one. Again, for Norska, Raven Blessed may gather grimoires and use these to receive boons of Zinch and Chaos. Uh, Zinch is chosen. Volric may directly, again, uh, the, yeah. Uh, dedicated to Zinch, may only devote himself to Zinch, has access to changing other ways. Forces receive benefits from having high winds of magic. When it comes to Lord effects, we have the following. Melee attack plus 8 for Zinch Marauder units, Lord's Army, ability Whispers of the Raven, and physical resistance, an extra 10% for Lord's Army. This is another faction that will be starting in the Eastern Steps, which means that you do have a lot to fight here. Uh, but, I mean, Zinch is possibly one of the stronger ones in melee, uh, because obviously you've got the barrier and so on. Once again, you know, you've got access to... Uh, Pretty much everything. Unit upgrades, going all the way up to Chosen and Knights, no Doom Knights, uh, which is a shame because I really, really like Doom Knights. Uh, and overall, yeah, I mean, this one is a strong one and it gets a little bit stronger once you start adding in the extra stuff, right? Because obviously you've got your unique skill line and that one focuses on, you know, being able to get extra items. Uh, you can get a chariot mount, by the way. This character is fairly decent in melee and gets a little bit stronger as you boost them up because the claw hand is really good for melee stuff. Again, massive reductions in terms of upkeep for Lord's Army, uh, boosting up your forces. Yeah, I mean, for those who are fans of Zinch and you want another reason to play another Zinch faction, which is a thing that I really enjoy. I like themed Norska factions like this. It's... Something that wouldn't really hurt too badly in terms of having it in a unique thing uh, for original vanilla stuff too, you know? I mean, still, they should split up the sub-races in the Tribes of the North thing, but uh, at the worst case scenario, Norskin-themed tribes would kind of work well. 
All right, we're on the last character here, and uh, this is Zacharias the Everliving, a very, very popular character from way back in the day. I've actually just recently stripped down his miniature so I can repaint it. Um, very fun vampire count character. Uh, and again, you know, this video is much longer than I expected it to be, proving once again why the Skeleton Crew guys are so good at what they do. But yeah, faction effects. Zacharias is able to collect the books of Nagash while on his journey for necromantic law. He's a big nerd after all. Uh, winds of magic, power reserve capacity plus 15, per uh, plus 15 not percent, uh, for all armies. Weapon strength plus 15% when fighting against humans or armies. When it comes to lord effects, it's wound recovery time minus two. A little bit of a throwback is, is he dead? Is he not dead? It's always been a weird thing for his law. Cooldown, minus 15% for Spirit Leech and Ability, Sycophant of Life. So with this character, you'll be starting off in the Hinterlands of Koresh at the top point. So you're going to be dealing with Nakai fairly early on if he starts coming down, which generally his AI kind of favors it. I'm not too sure if that's just happening for me. Uh, so yeah, get prepared to face some Croxagores very early on. Other than that, you're going to be fighting off some... Pretty generic greenskins, nothing too fancy about them. Uh, yeah, overall, yeah, not too much of a problem. The character itself is very, very strong, mostly because Zacharias is Zacharias. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of armor, but he does have a lot of weapon strength, and that's purely because, yeah, it's Zacharias. He's a spellcaster with the uh, law of uh, undeath. You can get him on the zombie dragon, which is his iconic pose. Uh, you can uh, make your grave guard a lot stronger too, which is pretty good. Overall, yeah, I mean, it's a fun character. The vampires might not be in the best place. There's a little visual bug there. This happens every now and then. It's not because of the game or anything. Uh, well, it is because of the game. It's not because of the mod, that's better yet said. But yeah, I mean, there's not too much to really talk about here. If you like vampires, you're definitely going to like this. And I feel like there's a lot of vampire fans out there. Because when I do like vampire count speculation, it's always one of my best uh, performing videos. So yeah, hopefully one day we'll get like, you know, the characters that we're waiting for. But we got a lot of modders bringing in these characters anyway in a very unique style. Some of those models are absolutely gorgeous. Zacharias just reminds me of his model, uh, which is why I've always been such a big advocate when it comes to uh, the modding community. Because again, if it looks like the model... That's freaking awesome, right? And uh, when it comes to the whole Books of Nagash thing, everything's in your area. Uh, very much like the whole Books of Eight thing. Very cool bonuses. Now, you do get a little bit more bonuses there if you go to Wolfenburg, which is in the Empire, because it doubles the effects just like everything else. The only problem is it's uh, other side of the world. But, hey, you know, if you've captured all of them, if you're doing for like a map takeover, I know that's not a lot of people do that. I, on the other hand, do. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's all 16 characters, I think. Unless I've forgotten one, which uh, the Skeleton Crew will remind me. <laughs> it happens every now and then. They just do so much, man. They post so many mods, it's hard to freaking keep up. And this is, like, I talk to them directly. It's like, oh yeah, we're working on this. It's like, god damn it, you just finished that like a day ago, you know? <laughs> this is why I've still been so, like, I've been negative about Total War, but still optimistic because we've got a modding community which is still throwing loads of stuff at us. So yeah, let me know what you guys think about this mod in the description below, uh, in the comments below. The mod itself will be in the description. I finished my Christmas shopping today, so I'm going to celebrate after this video goes live by having a nice beer. I think I deserve it. So, yeah, <laughs> and I'm going to go back to painting some Warhammer because, oh god, I've got so much to paint. But have a great day, everyone, and I'll see you all again very, very soon.